All right. Well, today we are in the second part of a series called Really Happy. Really Happy. And we're not talking about just being very happy or fake, you know, plastic smile happy. We're talking about how to be really, really, like deep down, not dependent on the crazy ups and down circumstances of life, not dependent on good emails and bad phone calls, right? But how to have a deep rooted sense of contentment, satisfaction with life. Now, if you've been around for the past year and then a little more, uh, you know, things have been pretty tough, right? Our emotions have been in a little bit of a grinder, I heard one person say. Uh, And this is legitimate. This is legitimate. We have been dealing with things like changes, right, constantly. I mean, today there's another change. Just this past week, another change. Uh, You know, we had this, like, I remember in the beginning of the pandemic, there were like these little benchmarks, you know, and for us, we measured it with school at first, with my daughter's school, like how long they'd cancel for, and it went a little further, a little further, and a little further, and it just kept going, kept getting, and that was really hard. And then with that, there came a lot of loss for a lot of people, right? Maybe, Maybe you knew someone that you actually lost because of the last year. Or maybe you lost an opportunity to graduate, to walk when you thought you would walk, the way you thought you would walk. I've spoken with couples who have lost the opportunity to have the wedding that they wanted to have. Maybe you lost the sense of security, maybe financial security, maybe emotional security. There is this like eye-opening uh, experience, really, at least, at least for me, of just how fragile the human race is. There's all this constant changes, uncertainty, disruptions to our routines, and so it's understandable. You know, like last week I told you about a little like traffic incident where people are like really, really on edge. I'm feeling like my zero to 60 speed has recently gotten a little bit faster. Maybe you are too. And so what we're looking at over the next couple of weeks are, are like the things or the aspects of our real, real, not circumstantial, but ultimate happiness or well-being. Uh, I told you last week about a pastor that I listened to who said, if you don't know why something's working, when it's working, you won't know how to fix it when it breaks. And for some of us over the past couple of years, our happiness has been maybe not broken, maybe like dented, maybe cracked, right? And so we're looking at how to be Really, really happy. Um, last week, last week. Now, this is one of those series. We like to put our messages in, in series here. So sometimes it's a common theme, and they're kind of individual messages. Sometimes they, they build on each other. Really, every message in this series is going to be individual, but they all kind of point back to the first one. The very first message, what we talked about last week, was this principle. It's a foundational principle that really we need to understand or at least be open to the possibility of believing on which we can build our happiness, right? Like this was like the bottom line, the baseline. And what we said is that like, okay, so if you think of happiness as a pursuit, right? Like the pursuit of happiness or the way to be really happy, on that way to be really happy, you know, we want to be a certain way to stay on the way to happiness. Like we want to be seen a certain way. We want to acquire things along the way in order to be really happy, right? But then there are some things we said that are in the way, in the way. Now, last week, I really gave my dentist a lot of heat, right? But I think that's a good example. Somebody like the dentist, for me, at least in my like little understanding picture of what happiness is, that would be something that's sort of someone that's in the way. And you got to You got to either avoid it or appease it. You got to handle it, right? Because you don't want it to show up later down the road and really, really get in the way of your happiness, right? And so, like, we've got things like the dentist, we've got things like taxes, right? Chores, all those things that you just kind of take care of so that you continue on your way to happiness. Well, for me, for me, and maybe you can relate to this a little bit, for me, one of those things was God. God was in the way 
of my happiness. And for a long time, I just kind of like tried to avoid the whole religious faith situation. Like, ah, I just don't really want to talk about it. Just like push, push it out of my mind. And then there came a point in my life where I was like, okay, I got to make a decision here. I got to like figure out what I'm going to do with this whole thing. And so I started to look into it. And at first, it really became something that I would appease, like the dentist, you know? All right, I'll go to church. Or like, I'll try to say a prayer. Maybe I'll try, like, if I'm feeling really good, maybe I'll try to read the Bible on my own. And, and then, like, that, in my mind at least, would protect me from some, like, feeling of guilt that might show up later on down the road. And so we just kind of, like, take care of it. And maybe you can relate a little bit. In fact, I said last week, like, maybe you were yanked here by the ear. And someone was like, like, we do not think about happiness when typically, when we think about God. For most of us, in fact, I would say for most people in our community, in our country, really, we know that people have like the happiness box that's filled with all sorts of great, fun, exciting things and experiences and possibilities. And then we've got like the God box, right? They're two totally separate things. And so we try to handle it and get God like out of the way of our happiness. But I showed you this metaphor that Jesus set up when he was teaching all these people. And they were, some were very religious and some were not. And he kind of turns this idea on its head. What he said is that the thief, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Now, this metaphor is not just about thieves. It was about sheep. And he was setting himself up as the shepherd in this situation, which for you and I is a little bit weird because most of us don't have sheep. I mean, if you do, maybe you really understand this analogy. But he's saying like, okay, like people are the sheep and I'm like the shepherd. And he's explaining how he cares for these people. But he, he opens up this little like exchange here with a picture of a thief. And if you're a shepherd, you know about the thief. You have to be mindful of the thief. There's certain precautions you have to take because if you don't, the thief is gonna get you. That's a very real reality. And what I said last week is, if I'm being totally honest, for a very long time in my life, the thief in my story was God. There were certain precautions that I had to take or God was gonna get me. There were certain boxes that I needed to check, certain things that I had to do, or, or I felt like God was gonna like, just really mess things up for me. It might show up like later on down the road, maybe like, maybe, I don't know, like punishment or like some kind of bad karma. I, I literally, I was a big basketball player in high school. Well, I was actually never a big basketball player, but I, I tried to play basketball in high school. And I remember sometimes having really bad games and right away wondering like, I wonder if God is mad with me. Like, I just always felt like he was out to get me. And it was because I understood him as a thief. But Jesus takes this and he totally flips it around. And this is the thing, like, if you've been in church for a long time, sometimes I think we get desensitized to statements like this. And if you haven't, and you just sit and, like, chew on this for a little bit, it could really, like, just blow your mind. He said, okay, so there's a thief that, like, comes to steal, kill, and destroy in this metaphor. He says, but I have come that they may have life. They mean in the sheep, the sheep being us life and have it to the full. Some translations say more abundantly. And it doesn't just mean like more life, like have a lot of life. It's saying like life that is, is deeply satisfying, not easy, not like super healthy, super wealthy and super prosperous, not like always good things all the time, but there is this sense of deep rooted satisfaction, like an anchor of joy. And he said, this is what I came to give people. And this is what we're talking about when we say real happiness. Real happiness. Happiness that like rides above the, the up and down crazy circumstances of life. Or maybe we could say like anchored within the crazy circumstances of life. And so that's what we talked about last week. Kind of to lay that foundation. With this whole idea that maybe God is not in the way of our happiness. Maybe he is in the business of our, not immediate, but ultimate happiness, concern for us, like a father is con concerned for his children. So maybe like you hear that, right? And you're like, okay, got it. Like right on, okay? But, but like now what, right? Like how? You know, where do you get this life to the full? Is it like, you know, two-day prime shipping, or can you just go out? Or, or maybe, like, <clears throat> do you have to say a prayer 
certain, like, say a certain prayer, and then boom, activated, you know? Or you take a certain course or perform a certain, is there like a certain thing that just like activates this life to the full? What Jesus is talking about here, it's, he's kind of making a summary statement of what it looks like to follow him. And so really, like the closest we could get to experiencing this, it's not like a all of a sudden, now I'm experiencing life to the full. It, it, it's a, it really is a process. In other places, it's described as like the form of like sowing, like you would sow a seed. And so the best thing we could do is just look at what he says, specifically in this case, as it relates to real joy, happiness, and do it. In fact, Jesus left behind followers after him who continued his teaching. And not only did they like remember what Jesus said, but they did, they lived the way that he invited them to live. And so their very lives were like examples of what this looks like. Some of them had really, 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 really hard lives, really hard lives. And yet throughout it, there is this feeling of like, deep satisfaction, contentment, people don't understand, and they were attracted to it. And so one of those followers, his name was Paul. We've talked about him a lot. He wrote a lot of letters to a lot of different churches. And in one of those letters, he's expanding on this idea of abundant life, of life to the full, what he refers to as like being full of God's spirit, like living with a constant awareness of God, like a loving deeply concerned father in our lives. And he paints this picture of real joy, not of like rich people getting everything they want, not of things going like in their way all the time, but this picture of contagious joy and constant encouragement. He talks about like singing, making music from the heart, which was like not so common for us. We typically don't sing in many social settings, but they did back then. They would sing at like dinner which to me just sounds a little awkward, but that was like a real sign of, of joy for them. He paints this whole thing. He talks about how they would like quote the things that God has said to one, of, one another to like build each other up. And then he throws this blanket statement over the whole entire thing. In the original language, it's called a participle, which is not something that we use too often in like the English language, but it basically blankets the whole thing as if to say during this whole thing, like the heartbeat of this, this life of contagious joy, of real happiness, what Jesus might have called life to the full. He said, during all of this, all of this, always giving thanks to God the Father, for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, like, normally I like to kind of build up to, like, the punchline or what we call the big idea, but today I'll just, like, throw it out there right away. We're talking about today happy people, the things that make us really happy, the way to be really happy. Happy people are grateful people. Happy people are grateful people. Now, like the idea of gratitude, I don't know, but like to me, it's not all that like exciting. It's not super sexy, right? Uh, for me, for me, for a very long time, like gratitude, the way I understood gratitude was really, really like when we talk about happiness and gratitude, really gratitude for me was like the, the other option to like real happiness. It was like the alternative to, or, or maybe like a payment for real happy, happiness. I mean, think about this. When was the last time somebody told you to be grateful, right? Like, I don't know. I can think of some times where maybe I had something, but I wanted something else. You know, it's like, well, I want that. Really, because I think it's gonna make me happy. Like, oh, I want this. And I'm so like, no, you can't have that. Be grateful for what you have. And it's like, okay, gratitude, option two, right? <laughs> Or, or, and I do this to my kids, like, you know, someone would give me something good and it'd be like, I, I'd, I'd be so excited for it. I'd be like, hey, 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 say thank you, right? I, I do this to my kids all the time. And that's good, right? We should teach our kids manners. Like these, those are both very true things. But over time that for me, like kind of painted the picture of like, okay, gratitude is just like a really crummy second option to being happy, being happy. In fact, in fact, I would read passages like the one we just read, like always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. It's like, okay, well, that's a lot, right? Like, you're telling me 
that God wants everybody to thank him for everything all the time. Like really, really for me, it was just kind of like, does, does he just want to be, get like a pat on the back all the time? Is he really like that concerned with people saying thank you to him? That everybody's gonna be thanking him all the time. It didn't really paint a really like nice picture of God for me. Feeling like every time I got something good, I had to go to God and thank him for it. And so like God being like, you know, displayed or painted or whatever as this, this person or individual or being that wants all the thanks all the time, like really that was very unappealing. And that's true, right? That is a pretty unappealing picture. If, if gratitude is simply saying thanks and if it's solely for the benefit of the one receiving the thanks, the gratitude, but it's not. It's not. In fact, some of you probably know this. Gratitude, turns out gratitude is like pretty sexy. Gratitude, we're finding out, is like the, it is essential. It is essential to our emotional well-being. Like gratitude, what we know now is that gratitude is just as much, if not more, of a benefit to the one who is giving the thanks as it is to the one receiving the thanks. And you can tell like right away, if that's true, then all of a sudden like God is not this, this being that's just self-absorbed. All of a sudden, again, it's this picture of him actually caring for people. If he knows like we have to be grateful in order to be joyful, well then, then he's a father who cares about us. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we did a series called Not Enough. I talked about this researcher, her name, was, uh, her name is Brene Brown. And she said, she said that she had, she's not a Christian, right? At least as far as I know. Or at least her writings are not faith-based. She, said, like, she made a commitment to never, never talk about joy without talking about gratitude. Because there is such a deep connection between the two of them. Some would even say that your ability to experience joy is directly related to your willingness to practice gratitude. The two, the two are so closely related. And, and gratitude, like really what it comes back to is a misunderstanding of gratitude. If you followed us online, we did a whole series around Thanksgiving where we talked about gratitude. What we said is that gra gratitude, gratitude is not just, it's not simply saying thanks. It is choosing to see the good and call out the good. Not saying everything is good, but pulling the good out of situations. Gratitude is what gives us the ability to experience joy. So think about it like this, right? Here's like a pretty far-fetched uh, little visual here. I always have a bucket behind the TV. You never know when you're gonna need a bucket. Uh, so imagine like I'm really hungry, okay? And so because I'm hungry, I'm gonna go on like a search for food because I wanna be full. Right? So like I'm walking around, I'm like, ooh, I'm so hungry. And I see like an apple, you know, and I pick that up. I'm like, ooh, okay, so hungry. I'm going to pick this up. And I just keep like looking and like picking things up. And, and I'm like a long way, I'm like, oh man, I'm just so hungry. I got to keep looking for food. And so like we just keep going and just keep like filling and it's like, ah, oh, I'm so hungry. And so we just keep going and just keep going and just keep going. But I'm still so hungry. I need to get more food. Gratitude is like sitting down and eating the food. I was going to bring an apple up here, but I hate the sound of chewing, and I can't imagine chewing into the microphone. <laughs> it's, it's stopping and enjoying what you have rather than chasing what might bring you joy out there. And so this is us, right? Like we'll walk around like trying to be happy, be like, oh, that, that's going to make me happy. Like, oh, and, and oh, this is going to make me happy. And like, that's going to make, oh, just, and, but we just like keep like looking like, oh, I'm just not happy. I'm not happy. So maybe I'll like get this car, like that'll make me happy. Or like date this guy, he'll make me happy. Nope, he didn't, right? It's like, okay. 
And, and we like keep going. And then we're like, I'm just, I'm just not happy. I, gratitude, it's like the key that unlocks the ability to enjoy what you have. It's stopping the pursuit of happiness and allowing yourself to experience it. Here's another one, right? And if you like to read, in fact, if you like to study the Bible or the New Testament, a great little thing to study would be the amount of times that joy and thanksgiving come up together, right? Here's another one. The Apostle Paul, same guy who wrote the last letter. He said, rejoice always. He's not saying walk around with a fake smile. He's saying, let joy be the dominating like emotion, state of your life. He says, pray continually. It's this idea of like looking to your loving father for the things that you need. We'll get more into that on a separate week. And then he says, give thanks in all circumstances, in all circumstances. Now, maybe, I don't know where everybody is right now, but maybe right now your circumstances stink. Sometimes they do. Like we were just in a pandemic. Some of us have experienced very real and very serious loss. Gratitude is not saying that something is good. It's not pretending to be happy when we're not. It is choosing to see our circumstances and like the, see the good in our circumstances and, and pull it out. Pull the good out of our circumstances. Gratitude for most of us does not require a change of circumstances. It requires a change of focus. We need to learn to see the good. This, this pandemic that we just went through, I'll tell you right now, like the, the unfortunate truth about the situation, there are some people that are coming out a lot stronger than when they went in. More resilient, more optimistic, more caring about the people around them. But there are also people who are not. And really, like, this is what it comes back to. Can you look at your difficult circumstances? And rather than labeling them and everything in them as, as irredeemable, horrible circumstances, but pull the good out of it, it totally has the, it has the ability to totally alter how we experience life. And you can find yourself with an anchor of joy in the midst of hardship. Uh, the writers in the New Testament, they, they like talk a lot about gratitude. They are people that are living this way, like, like this life, abundant life, life to the full. And so in their writing, it comes out and we see them constantly expressing thanksgiving. And one of the things, you know what they thank God for like most often or one of the things they thank God for most often? You know what it is? People. People. In the writings, like the beginning of the letters, read them. It'll be like, I thank God every time you cross my mind. Or I, I thank God because of your faith, because of your, the confidence you have in this message, because of the way you treat one. Like he, they are constantly seeing the good in people. And what's interesting is that a lot of those letters are written because there were problems in the churches. But he opens up like acknowledging the good that he sees. And I think for us right now, like post pandemic, coming out of this COVID world, like still living in the wake of it. I think this is like our biggest issue with gratitude. Not seeing the good in the people around us. We have been conditioned to see the lack. That's just, it's part of our nature and it's all around us. To see what we don't have, to see where things aren't what they should be, where they could be better. And that like just, it just bleeds into our relationships as well. So let me ask you, the people that you live with, do you tend to see the good, to be grateful, or do you tend to see the lack? Or, or let me ask it this way, like your, your, I see this good in you versus I have a problem with this, like the ratio, is it more, this is what bothers me, or this is the good that I see? We naturally naturally lean toward like, hey, come on, can you pick your stuff up a little? Okay, okay, come on, like just constant, constant, constant. There's uh, a couple in our community group. We were talking about this, talking about gratitude, talking about relationships. 
And uh, she said that she keeps a, a list on her phone in the Notes app of all the things she's grateful for in her husband. Every time she sees him do something she loves, like the way he plays with her kids, the way he cares about her, the way that he goes out of her way, the way that he spends time, the sacrifices. And every time he does something, or at least when she can remember, she's like, right, I love this about him. Just like keep that list going. And she said, in those moments or seasons when we're struggling, when all I can see are like what he lacks, I go back to my list and I see it through the lens of all the good that he is. Could you just imagine if each one of us had a note with it? Maybe it's your kids, maybe it's your parents, maybe it's your roommate, maybe it's a sibling, maybe it's your spouse. But the people you live and just like, just in like drown yourself in the good things that they are. If you watch the news, what you're gonna see is like nine out of 10, maybe eight out of 10. Stories are gonna be all about the bad in people. And that like, we are conditioned. We are conditioned to not be grateful for people. But if we were, it would change relationships. So, so if this is true, if this is true, if happy people, are grateful people. If gratitude is essential to our ultimate happiness, this isn't very spiritual, but I think it'll be like a helpful point of application, then anything that undermines your gratitude ultimately undermines your happiness. Think about that. What are the things in life that rob you of gratitude, that make you feel a lack of contentment. I was listening to someone this week who said that he and his wife have this little phrase that like help each other actually not spend money. He said, awareness breeds discontent. And in the context of the story, he was like, yeah, we were driving by this store called Restoration Hardware. Yeah, it's a nice store, got a lot of nice things. Uh, really expensive things. And they're driving by and they're like, hey, should we stop? And they looked at each other and they're like, all right, awareness breeds discontent, right? Because if, again, this is like a right or a wrong thing. This is like, this is a, is this going to undermine my gratitude? All of a sudden, is my stuff gonna start to stink in light of this, all this brand new stuff on this showroom floor? If you wanna know how to ruin something that you are extremely grateful for, go look at other versions of it. If you have a car that you love, and is meeting all your family's needs and is doing everything you need. And sure, it's got like a little ding on it, but it gives it personality and it's fantastic and you love it, right? Just go to a car dealership. Just go, spend some time in there, ask some questions, take a test drive. All of a sudden, like when you're done, you're gonna walk out to your car with that scratch on the back of it and poop on the windshield. And it's not gonna, it's not all of a sudden, all, again, this is not right or a wrong thing. This is like, let me make you feel bad. This is like, if gratitude is essential to my joy, then what is taking away my gratitude? It's true. Awareness breeds discontent. I think, you know, if you're familiar with the Ten Commandments, there's this whole idea of not envying and not like coveting. It says, covet your neighbor, don't covet your neighbor's wife, which is like kind of a weird thing. And typically we're like, oh, God doesn't want us to envy or covet our neighbor's wives. But if we're like sitting there and we're like, I want that. You can't chase after that while being content with this. And if he really cares about you experiencing joy, he's gonna show you how to do it. We may be robbing ourselves of the ability to be really happy because of what we're going after. This is the whole, like not to get into a totally different thing, but really this is the whole idea of pornography. If you, if you want to rob yourself of the ability to, to be intimate with the person that you love, just go and expose yourself to all sorts of different things. Doesn't have to be better, just has to be different. It's not like a, this is wrong. It's like, a, what are you doing to yourself? Don't you wanna enjoy the person that you love? Awareness, awareness breeds discontent. And anything that undermines my gratitude is ultimately undermining my happiness. 
And so like, kind of like we've been getting at this the whole time, but I showed you this verse before. He said, rejoice always, pray continually and give thanks in all circumstances, but he's not done. He says, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, if you haven't heard the term like God's will, it's not like a document. What this literally means in the original language, it means what God wants. This is his desire for you. This is what he wants you to experience. He wants, it's his will for, for you. For you. He wants you to find joy in what you have. And he's not saying like, be happy with what you have and don't chase after other things. It's this idea that if you're chasing other things, you can't be happy with what you have. I honestly, with this whole series, okay, conf confession, right? This series, we're talking about being really happy. But we say like, as a church, our mission is to change the way people think about God. And in our culture, people think that God is, is in the way of their happiness. Like, there's a twofold agenda here. I, I want to get back to the things that make us really happy, but I also want you to see that there's a God who really, really cares. And we know all this fancy psychological stuff about gratitude now, but they didn't then. They were just like, all right, let's just say thanks again because that's what God tells us to do in these holy scriptures. He is deeply invested in your well-being. How would that change? How would that change our lives? No matter where you are on the faith spectrum, if we really believed, we really believe, God said that because he cares. No matter what it is, gratitude, anything else, God said that because he cares, because he loves us. How would that change the way we approach everything that he said? That he says, he is deeply concerned. He is in the business of your happiness. I'm gonna call the band up here, uh, but I'll leave you with this little story, a little Harvard experiment. Um, it was called the, the Tetris effect. Uh, and basically what they did, these people, these really smart professors at Harvard, they had these students, 27 students, play Tetris every single day uh, for seven days, for a few hours every day for seven days. And what happened was that the people who were playing Tetris for a few hours every single day, just for seven days, they started having dreams about shapes. If you don't know Tetris, the idea is to take like weird shapes and fit them into weird gaps. And so they, they said like, I literally am having dreams of shapes falling. I can't stop seeing it. They said when they would walk into a room, all of a sudden they would notice how things fit. Like they'd be like, oh, you see those squares up there? If you just turn that and flipped it sideways, it would fit just perfectly into the square hole beneath it. Like, did you see those? those there's, a, there's a gap in between each row. You could fit three chairs. And they just started to see the world differently. They called it the Tetris effect. And then they, they tried to apply this principle, see if it worked in other areas. So they had people once a day, right for seven days, once a day, write down three things that they were thankful for, three things that happened in the last 24 hours, to see the good that happened in the last 24 hours. And they reported that they had lasting effects for the next seven days, for the next month, for the next three months, for the next six months, just because of those seven days, because they chose to see the good. What we, they found with our like minds is that what we once had to look for intentionally, we eventually start to see naturally. This is why you have friends who walk into a room and immediately see what's wrong. They, they hear a story, a situation right away. They, they tell you what's bad about it because they have been conditioned to. They have, they're not trying to be negative. They're not trying to be Debbie Downers, but this is just what, what happens. It's also why you have friends who habitually see the good. What, what they once looked for intentionally, they now see naturally. So if you're like me and you just went through a pandemic and things like really stunk for a while, like maybe we could get back to this. Maybe just for seven days, seven days. Maybe do it at the dinner table with your family. If you live with your family, maybe you start dinner and just everyone go around say in the past 24 hours, this is something that happened that was good or something good that I got out of something bad. It really, it really will make a change to the way that we feel, to our ultimate happiness. And my hope is that if we do that, yes, I want you to be happy, 
But more importantly, I want you to see that there is a God who, is, who knew this 2,000 years ago before we had any of these studies, who cares deeply, who is deeply invested in your well-being. Let's pray together. God, we are grateful. We are grateful. But we're, we're not uh, grateful enough. Or we're not as grateful as we could be, I should say. And so would you help us to implement these little habits, to teach ourselves to see the good all around us. And in all of that, be reminded that you are good, that you care for us. We wanna change the way that we think about you. We wanna see you as a father who cares. God, change the way, change the way that we understand you. In Jesus' name we pray.